Well, uh, Rolf Winkler joins us to talk about a scoop he got today. Uh, Elon Musk wants to connect your brain, basically, with computer chips to help humanity keep pace with artificial intelligence. And he founded a new startup called Neuralink to do just that. Rolf Winkler of the Wall Street Journal broke the news of Musk's latest company and what it's all up to and joins us to talk about it right now. Rolf, how far along is Musk with Neuralink and how does he envision this technology eventually working? Hey, Nate, how you doing? Um, it's embryonic at this stage. Neuralink is a new company to really go after what Elon has teased over the past year. He's teased something called neural lace technology, what he calls neural lace. This idea, uh, scientists call it neural interface, but it's this idea that you could basically create an, inter, an, an AI layer inside your brain to help it communicate more quickly, more directly with a computer. Neuralace is such a such a, a weird name. Is do you have any insight as to why he's choosing uh, that terminology versus uh, uh, others? Well, you know, Neuralace is his formulation. I think it's a little catchier than what this what scientists call neural interface. Um, great for branding. I think. Look, right now. Uh, I describe roughly what the technology is, that idea of we're going to connect your brain to, to with basically what it is, is you put electrodes in your brain. This is what scientists talk about today. Um, they're already doing it, by the way. Uh, but but the idea is we would kind of take very small microscopic electrodes, you get them into your brain, um, and then they would, you know, who, who knows how the magic's going to happen, but once they get it to work... Um, uh, we can go at that, go into that in a little more detail, but yeah, then you'd be able to talk to your computer instead of having to tap with your thumbs okay. right, so, on your keyboard. So essentially it would like up upload and download thoughts and, and commands from your brain, right? I mean, basically in like theory, you, yeah. in theory one day, right? So uh, before we even get to that, what's funny about this startup is if you talk to people who, uh, have had conversations, um, with Neuralink, uh, and with Elon, the, the, the thing that comes out is how it could be kind of similar to SpaceX and Tesla in this sense. So SpaceX, we think of as the company that wants to go to Mars, right? Crazy moonshot idea. Who knows if they're going to get there? But in the meantime, they're developing technology that serves a really important market need for SpaceX, its launch services. For a company like Neuralink, it is uh, brain disease, probably, um, as an entry point. So. Yeah, neural lace technology, as we just described it, putting a, a computer in your brain, that sounds totally nuts. But actually, we already do a version of that today. Parkinson's patients use something called deep brain stimulation, um, which is sort of a dumb neural interface, if you will. And it works for them fantastically well. The trick is, what if you could come up with better tools, uh, more effective <laughs> brain stimulation uh, was something they call a closed loop that can basically talk to your brain back and forth. Um, you might be able to solve intractable brain diseases like major depression, like epilepsy, uh, like some other things. These, these are things that scientists today are very excited about. And that could be the first step here for Neuralink long before they ever get to, you know, the, the appliance that they add to your brain or whatever. Um, to help you win the race with AI. So before we started the show, I asked you if you had a computer inside your brain and you were a bit cagey on your answer. You did not say yes, but you did <laughs> not say no either. Well, I'm just riffing off what Elon said himself where his idea, he, he made a famous, he, famous quote from him last year where he said, we're cyborgs already, right? People thought that was nuts, but his point was, look, you've got your smartphone and it's an extension of you. And a, lo a lot of what's in this phone is already you and the way you interact with it. The trick is that the problem is, as he said, as he saw it, you just interact with it very slowly, typing away with your thumbs. Uh, your output, in other words, is your output bandwidth, if you will, is limited as opposed to, say, your input, uh, your capability to take in information via your eyes. You, it's, you can take in a whole bunch of information very, very, very quickly. Um, so that's where that idea comes from. Do you already have a computer in your brain? No, physically, of course not. But 
We have a lot of computers around us all the time that really are extensions of ourselves. We sort of move the stuff that was in our brain out of our brain, right? Like I don't, uh, I don't know anyone's phone number. I don't know directions anywhere. Um, I don't know all the things that I learned in school because I can just Google them. <laughs> Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> Uh, sure. I think that's a great point. We are outsourcing more and more information, more and more tasks to uh, to our smartphones, to our computers every day as they get more efficient. My favorite thing, I remember I, I once saw a, a tweet. Somebody took an old ad circular from the 1980s, Radio Shack, and, and yeah. listed all of the various electronics, a couple dozen of them yeah. that you could buy at Radio Shack, everything from an alarm clock to an AM, FM radio to whatever, and the person who tweeted the photo said, all of these 30 devices are now in your smartphone, right? The point is these devices are getting so capable, they can do so many things for you, you're outsourcing more and more tasks to them, uh, and it, it, it's a trend that will probably continue. Awesome. Well, who else in Silicon Valley uh, is up to these sorts of things? You mentioned that on the medical side, there are kind of very rudimentary versions of, of you yeah. know, tooling with your brain with technology. Uh, but are there any other tech leaders or any other startups trying to solve similar problems that Musk will be essentially competing with? Sure. There's one in particular that people have talked about called Kernel, which is was founded by Brian Johnson, the founder of Braintree. He's pumping $100 million into that company to do something very, very similar, which is uh, start off with uh, to, to create a brain computer interface, a neural interface technology in the first instance to help deal, to help cure brain disease, but then um, to work toward a device, an augmentation device um, that will, like as Elon puts it, help us win the race with AI. That's, that's, another, that's another big startup. But another reason to be excited about this space is th there definitely are a lot of other um, smaller startups that you just get get a feel for in my reporting i found a few people who you know had stealth things behind the scenes that they didn't want to talk about but they were about to launch um one thing that's happening by the way there's a darpa program that's going to pump 60 million dollars over four years into this area and some of the t scientists out there say you know they think about the grand challenge the darpa grand challenge back in 2004 which created a Cambrian explosion of innovation when it came to self-driving car technology. You could, there's a hope that something similar could happen here. So you, you know, obviously, Elon Musk uh, runs Tesla and uh, he runs SpaceX. And as you say in your article, he just did this in his spare time. Do you think that he's sort of just uh, betting on this just in case uh, mo the Model 3 doesn't uh, ever come out? <laughs> you know what, he is certainly stretched thin He's taking a very active role in setting up Neuralink. This is not something he's farming out. Uh, that's from the sources we speak to. And uh, yes, I, I, look, I think he's definitely got a lot on his mind. Right now, SpaceX is actually he's spending all his time worrying about a launch this Wednesday where SpaceX is planning to make history, um, launching a booster that's been used before, right? They did some amazing things, bringing those boosters back to Earth and landing them, the, the magical uh, videos you see. I'm sure you guys have played them for your viewers at some point. Uh, now we're going to send one of those back up. So yeah, the guy's got a lot on his plate. We got the Model 3, which we're trying to deliver this year. Is this something that he's also going to be able to handle? Great question. But you know what? People have bet against this guy before. Uh, you know, traditional automakers said he'd never deliver a popular electric car that people wanted to buy. Uh, you know, military industrial graybeard said, he's never going to get a rocket launched in the air and here he's stolen a very very big chunk of their market share so you know it's it's he's going to stretch himself thin perhaps but it's tough to bet against him and if we are really living in a simulation then you might as well come up with all of your crazy ideas right well, why not have fun with it why not hey why not if somebody else is going to do it why not me well, let's talk about the hurdles that he has to pull this stuff off. I mean, obviously there's competition as you talked about before and and there are some lower level things in the medical field, but what what will it take to actually realize these goals other than a lot of money, right? You're gonna need doctors to buy into working with these sorts of things uh, uh, with the company. And then you're probably gonna need human people being willing to have these electrodes put into their brain. Is that right? Well, here, I'll, I'll, give, this, I'll give the science a shot. Uh, hopefully I don't mess it up too badly. Some of the challenges that scientists talk about when it comes to neural interface are 
first off, getting an electrode, uh, coming up with an electrode design that can be implanted in your brain that will remain stable. Right now, there's some some out there tech. So I, th I think basically getting an electrode in your brain that can continue communicating, as it were, uh, they don't last for anything longer than a year, and generally a lot shorter period than that, is my understanding. So getting an electrode into your brain, designing one that will be stable, is one hard, is one challenge. Uh, second challenge is delivering it. How are we going to actually implant these things safely uh, in your brain? That's another challenge. A third is is basically reading and decoding the signals, right? L let's say we get a whole bunch of, we, we figure out an electrode that'll go into your brain. Um, uh, we figure out how to get it in there. We've got to get enough of, in them in, of, enough of them in there so that we can read a lot of your thoughts. Um, we can, right, right now, science is sort of limited to, to a few hundred, uh, basically reading the information from a, hu a few hundred neurons in your brain at a time. To decode thoughts, you would, no one knows how many you'd have to track, but probably uh, many orders of magnitude more than that. So there's also that, and last, you also then have to write the algorithms to interpret all that data that's coming out so that you can, uh, first of all, interpret it, and then theoretically down the line, send information back, right? And then, of course, last, there's the problem of trying to convince people to get elective brain surgery at that point, if we do go the augmentation route, but that's <laughs> way far in the future. Awesome. Well, great scoop here, Rolf. Uh, lots of great details. We look forward to learning more about this you know, pretty crazy idea as it, as it, as it grows. Um, you can follow Rolf on Twitter at Rolf Winkler, and you can read his work at wsj.com slash tech. Thanks for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it.